So to begin, um, if you have any questions, you can see uh, on the slide here exactly how to go about entering them into the queue. And at the end of the presentation, any questions that are in the queue, uh, we will take the time to go ahead and answer. Quick agenda on what will be covered. We're going to open with demand factors, including a review of the winner uh, that we just recently completed, 2014-2015, uh, as well as uh, spring forecast looking forward. We'll then move on to pricing and constraints, including a review of pricing uh, for the most recent winter, uh, as well as some historical congestion comparison. We'll then finish up with supply details, including an update on water supply, as well as uh, covering some of the renewable generation growth that continues to impress uh, to a large degree. And we'll wrap up at the end with any questions that you may have. So to begin, we'll take a look at uh, winter 2014 and 15 compared to winter 2013 and 2014. And this is just a look at some of the upper level pattern. And the, the take home from this, uh, this plot is showing that we have a very similar setup uh, to what we saw at the upper levels uh, in 2013 and 2014 in the atmosphere, uh, with the warm colors representing uh, positive height anomalies, which are typically associated uh, with higher pressures and are uh, symbolic of ridging across much of the western U.S. And as you can see, uh, with the 2013-14 graphic on the right and the 2014-15 graphic on the left, uh, it is a similar setup. Uh, the biggest difference here is that the ridging itself uh, propagated a bit further uh, eastward during this winter, and that led to some of the more widespread uh, warm conditions that we saw throughout not just California, uh, but the greater west as a whole. This plot breaks down um, the percent of normal precipitation for the most recent winter uh, on the top left, as well as um, the percent of normal precipitation uh, for last year's winter, 2013-2014. And on the bottom, we have the temperature plots. As you can see, uh, this winter experienced uh, much more widespread warmth uh, with warm colors uh, throughout the entire west, uh, including some areas seeing temperature departures of more than 10 degrees from normal, um, which is quite impressive, uh, especially interior sections of WEC. There was more precip, but given these warmer temperatures, um, we saw more hydro and runoff during the winter. And as a whole, we expect this to lead to less runoff due to lower snow water equivalents come springtime. Also worth pointing out, uh, Four Corners saw the strongest precipitation anomalies um, associated with that weak El Nino signal that we saw, uh, leading to an enhanced seasonal monsoon. Just to get a sense of some of the lower uh, snow water equivalents, we're going to take a look here at, um, at various regions of the west uh, and some plots showing year-over-year -year differences in snow water equivalent. To begin, we'll look at the, um, the Columbia Basin. And as you can see, uh, with, the, with last year on the right, uh, March, and uh, this March on the left, you can see we are behind in snow water equivalent levels uh, from the same time last year, including uh, coverage as well. It's a less widespread coverage uh, of the Columbia River Basin. Next, we'll take a look at the Cascades. And uh, a fairly similar story here. Uh, the snow coverage is less widespread, um, as well as lower snow water equivalent values, including at higher elevations. Here we're looking at Northern California. And this is, uh, has a bit more similarity uh, to last year. You can even see that there's actually uh, broader coverage of snow cover uh, this year versus last year. The difference is that uh, we do see lower snow water equivalent values at the mid-elevation. So it's not necessarily any worse than last year, but it's also not markedly better. Similar story in the Sierra Nevada um, in Southern California and Central California. Uh, we do see, uh, similar to uh, Northern California, more coverage, more widespread coverage. 
uh, and again, uh, lower snow water equivalent values at the uh, mid-elevations. Next, we'll move ahead to uh, the rankings for uh, both temperature and precip uh, throughout the West for this most recent winter. As you can see, uh, there's some strong uh, anomalies and, and, um, and warm colors in the plot on the left showing divisional breakdowns of average temperature rank. And in this plot, any number with a 121 signifies the warmest December 2014 through February 2015 period on record. So that encompasses the entirety of California and Nevada, um, with much of the region seeing either the warmest or the second warmest uh, winter stretch on record. Uh, on the right, you'll notice that we have a similar map showing the precipitation rankings. And compared to last year, this map is uh, much closer to normal, uh, with some areas in eastern WEC, as well as the Four Corners region, seeing uh, above normal precip uh, throughout the December to February time frame. And as stated before, Four Corners and Eastern WEC uh, saw the above normal with areas in Western WEC seeing near normal conditions. Moving into the demand part of, uh, of winter 2014-2015 and historical look back, you'll notice that we did see a demand peak uh, in December, which isn't out of the ordinary, of 31.6 gigs. And in this time frame, uh, breaking it out by region, you'll see that uh, we saw 14.4 gigs for PG&E, 14.1 gigs for SD, 3.1 gigs for San Diego. And the only one to set a, uh, a high as far as the last five years, looking back, um, was actually, uh, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. For this winter, we did not see any new highs. We saw actually quite anomalously low demand values. Uh, that 31.6 demand figure was the lowest of the previous six years, uh, far and away falling more than 700 megawatts short of the previous low, which occurred 2010, 2011. Uh, this low demand period was also amplified by continued build-out uh, in behind-the-meter solar generation, which seems to be impacting um, load growth seen not just in the winter but throughout other portions of the year. As far as the timing of the de demand peak this year, it fell in line with what we're accustomed to seeing, which is a mid to early December demand peak. Moving into the spring time frame, uh, we'll take a look back uh, briefly at 2014 spring. And the story here is that we saw anomalous warmth throughout most of Western WEC, uh, indicated by the warm colors um, in the plot on the left, with the majority of that warmth concentrated in California. The plot at the right shows precipitation as a percent of normal. And in that plot, we see the above normal precipitation was generally limited to coastal regions of the Pacific Northwest, uh, with Southern WEC and uh, more notably Southern California seeing the brunt of the below normal precipitation conditions. Breaking this down uh, into a monthly look back, uh, you'll notice that after starting off with only uh, slightly above normal to normal conditions temperature-wise uh, in the March time frame. Conditions did become increasingly warm, uh, with May proving to be the most anomalous of the three months last year. And accompanying this, uh, this cooler start uh, was enhanced precipitation, uh, especially confined to northeastern regions, um, or northwestern, sorry, of uh, the greater WEC area. And as we progressed through the spring, uh, conditions did become drier, with many areas seeing uh, normal to below normal conditions by the time May rolled around. Looking back at last spring and uh, the springs prior, dating back to 2010, you'll notice that there is a wide variety uh, of uh, peak demand values dating back to 2010, ranging more than 
uh, or close to 12 gigs, I should say. And this increased strength seems associated uh, with increasing demand in the SCE and SDG load zones. You'll notice that from 2010 to 2012, the highest peak was about 16 and a half gigs. And you can see that in SE, and in the last two seasons, in the spring, we've seen a demand peak uh, at or above uh, 20 gigs. Quite an impressive range of demand values across the spring. Uh, generally, it's proven to be a May peaking uh, season. Uh, as you can see, looking back at the last uh, five years, we've seen four of the five occur uh, in the May time frame with the lone exception being 2010, which also corresponded to uh, the lowest demand peak of the last five years. Despite last year seeing a higher peak value, uh, if you look at the plot or the chart in the bottom uh, of the screen, you'll notice that from a cumulative demand standpoint, uh, 2013 was higher than last year, signaling that uh, even though we saw a higher peak in 2014, there was more sustained uh, demand occurring in 2013. We'll take a look at the change in drought conditions uh, last year throughout the spring. As you can see, uh, the beginning of the season began with nearly 23% of WEC uh, falling outside of any drought categorization whatsoever. And most notably, you'll see that California stands out as the strongest uh, drought region with um, with much of the state encompassed in either extreme or exceptional drought conditions. And as you can see from the plot, moving into uh, late spring last year, the last reading prior to uh, June, you'll see an expansion of extreme and exceptional drought areas throughout west, as well um, as an increase in the area not considered. So there was relief uh, for portions of WEC falling outside of the drought categorization, uh, but the area experiencing extreme or exceptional drought increased by roughly 5% throughout WEC. We'll now move into expectations for the upcoming spring season. And what you see in front of you is the spring temperature anomaly forecast. And similar to what we've been experiencing for uh, the first portion or the portion of the winter was ridging in the west and troughing in the east. And this will continue, we expect, to a lesser degree than what we've been seeing uh, with roughly one to two degrees warmer than average conditions uh, prevailing through uh, northwestern sections of uh, the WEC region. And focusing more on California, most of the southern half of the state stands the best chance to be uh, normal from a temperature standpoint, uh, as well as interior sections of WEC uh, look to average about normal temperature conditions uh, throughout the spring season. Breaking this down from a month-by-month -month standpoint, uh, we will see uh, the spring begin in March here with above normal conditions persisting uh, in Southern California, really the southern two-thirds of California, and southwest sections of WEC. Moving into April, that warmth shifts uh, to northern sections of WEC with uh, northeastern sections standing the best chance to see not only above normal, but much above normal conditions up along the Canadian border. Lastly, rounding out the spring in May, uh, we do anticipate uh, below normal temperature conditions uh, developing throughout interior sections of WEC, as well as eastern half of California, including uh, Sacramento and into Nevada, we see it in Las Vegas as well. Now turning our attention to precipitation anomalies, uh, you'll notice that we do see uh, generally normal conditions prevailing throughout uh, the WEC area, with the exception being uh, above normal conditions, basically centered over the state of Idaho. And the above normal criteria falls as 25 to 50 percent uh, wetter than normal conditions. Taking a month by month look at this, you'll see that uh, both March and May have similar precipitation patterns uh, throughout the WEC region, with once again interior sections standing the best chance to see above normal precipitation, with April 
as we see it currently, uh, mostly normal conditions throughout uh, the entirety of WEC. One thing driving some of our temperature and precipitation expectations for the spring season is the current state of ENSO. And this is the most up-to-date uh, graphic regarding ENSO that was released uh, today in their weekly update. And as you can see, uh, the most recent four three rolling three-month periods, uh, it's quite a mouthful, average uh, the criteria necessary to exceed the El Nino threshold. And they've actually gone ahead and declared us uh, currently in an El Ni a weak El Nino state based on where we have seen recent observations, uh, as well as two weeks into, into March, they expect that the criteria will be met at the conclusion of this month to justify calling this an El Nino season. Now taking a look at drought conditions uh, as of the most recent update, you'll notice that we do see about 30% of uh, the West falling outside of any drought categorization whatsoever. And this is an improvement over this time last year where uh, roughly 23% of the region uh, was uh, classified as not having experiencing any drought. But despite this decrease in coverage of drought, we've seen an increase in the um, D3 and D4 categories, which are identified as extreme or exceptional drought. And the two plots on the right really show you that a large portion of that increase in coverage of the extreme and exceptional drought has occurred throughout the state of California. Despite the expectation for normal to above normal precipitation um, throughout, west, throughout the west, um, the CPC as well as uh, Genscape do anticipate uh, an increase or persistence in areas of experiencing drought uh, throughout the spring season. And this is mostly due to the fact that the drought has been so long standing and it would take uh, such a persistent period of precip to relieve it that even slightly above normal precipitation conditions will do uh, only minimal damage to uh, the existing drought that's been uh, many years in the development. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague Chris, who will take you into pricing and congestion. Thank you, Russ. Uh, so let's take a quick look at prices uh, across this winter, uh, December through February timeframe. Uh, the left-hand side, you'll see three charts here. Uh, the top indicates the day ahead prices. Uh, the, the middle chart, uh, the real-time prices, and then the, the bottom chart uh, is where we have the heat rates for both NP and SP. Uh, now, just taking a look at the on-peak prices, uh, it, it does appear that uh, the winter of 2014 and 15 was uh, the second cheapest uh, over the last four years. Uh, however, this hides a couple of uh, key differences. Uh, one, the, the prices seen last winter, uh, which were by far the highest, uh, were primarily driven by extremely high gas prices across a couple of days uh, in both December and February, uh, with a couple of cold snaps seen up across the entire West, but uh, also really across the entire country, which uh, led to some freeze-offs and uh, gas prices spiking across the board. Uh, and then in, in 20, uh, the winter of 2012 to 2013, uh, that was when we really saw SDE PCT uh, impacting uh, the SP market uh, which is why those prices uh, were considerably higher um, than what we're seeing right now. Uh, now looking at the chart at the bottom left, uh, you will see that heat rates uh, actually are quite a bit higher than uh, really any of the previous three winters, uh, with the exception of, of, of SP due to the SCE PCT. Uh, and there are a couple of key reasons uh, why that is the case. Uh, taking a look at this next chart, uh, you'll see that there are a couple of hours uh, where heat rates uh, are considerably lower uh, year on year. Uh, this chart compares the differences between heat rates seen this past winter, uh, the December through February timeframe, versus 
2013. And you'll see hours ending 11 through 15, uh, they're considerably lower uh, than heat rates seen last year. But then you move uh, down and hours ending 18 through 21, uh, and you can probably throw hour ending 17 in there as well, are considerably higher. Uh, and just looking at heat rates uh, charted on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see a pretty familiar curve. Uh, it looks a lot like that duck curve uh, that I'm sure everyone is well aware of uh, due to the very large growth in solar in the market. Uh, and that is having a pretty, a pretty big impact uh, where you would expect it to. Uh, the middle part of the day is being uh, pushed down uh, just due to all the uh, increase in cheap generation across that solar time frame. Uh, but then you get uh, a much bigger increase in heat rates uh, across that morning ramp and evening ramp as solar is no longer a factor, um, but you have to bring online a lot of, a lot of more expensive uh, generation in a short time frame uh, to make up for that sudden loss of solar. Uh, now looking at congestion uh, this past winter, uh, you'll see that we were uh, slightly stronger than, than what we saw last year, uh, about 52% actually uh, between uh, the 2012 and 2014 years. Uh, again, the reason that 2013 stands out uh, is because of SDEPCT. Um, but this year, uh, the, the congestion was mostly driven by a couple of uh, key outages or a couple of key uh, constraints. Um, there were some rolling outages in the San Diego area, uh, as well as some transformers uh, in the LA basin, um, and then intertie D rates that are typical of uh, some borderline shoulder months. Uh, and I know winter isn't technically a shoulder month, but in California, especially this year, uh, given how low load was, uh, it, it behaved that way somewhat. Um, now, looking at the uh, congestion at a hub level, uh, it's very similar to what we've seen uh, in the past three, three or four years. Uh, a couple of differences are the degrees to which uh, San Diego congestion stands out, um, much higher than really any other year. Uh, that is primarily due to those rolling outages I uh, alluded to earlier, uh, the Miguel uh, mission uh, outages. Uh, they're consistently leading to some SX tap uh, mission congestion, uh, and that's actually continuing uh, through this month as well. Uh, and then the SDE congestion uh, is primarily driven by those transform outages uh, at Serrano. Um, between December and uh, most of January, uh, there were several different transformers out at, uh, at Serrano on, on different time periods, and there was some very strong congestion and very persistent congestion uh, associated uh, with that as well. Uh, again, SDE uh, 2013 stands out for uh, the SDE PCT constraint, and that actually uh, drastically influences all of the, all of the constraints uh, across that, those years. Um, Off-peak congestion, uh, somewhat of a different story. Uh, there was hardly any congestion to speak of. Uh, the average values were either five cents or, or lower on either side uh, of, of zero, so uh, not too much going on there. Uh, now looking at the top 10 constraints uh, seen this winter, 35% uh, uh, had to do with uh, congestion in two areas that I've already alluded to um, for uh, very specific reasons, uh, the Miguel Mission and Serrano uh, transformer outages. Um, there were also uh, some constraints uh, that were caused by outages on some of the inner ties. Uh, the Malin 500 uh, had to do with outages actually on the knob inner tie uh, in the sense that knob was taken completely out, so the only way uh, power can get from the Pacific Northwest to California uh, was via uh, PACI, um, which is now uh, the Malin 500 constraint. Uh, I think I believe it used to be the PACI uh, MSL or branch group constraint. Um, so that's uh, 14 days uh, now without, and we saw very strong uh, Malin congestion. Uh, and then conversely, uh, PACI was derated by at least a gig uh, several other days, and, and so that had the opposite effect with uh, impacting some pretty strong congestion on the knob inner tie. Uh, and finally, uh, PV was derated uh, quite a bit. Uh, actually, over 11 days, uh, two-thirds, uh, give or take, uh, were taken out. Uh, so there's very strong congestion for those days, uh, as well as some uh, moderate congestion six other days when it was out by about a gig. 
Uh, and finally, uh, we saw various uh, constraints in the Humboldt area. Uh, and, and winter is typically uh, the uh, Humboldt area's uh, peaking time period. Um, but I, I believe this year most of that congestion was actually driven by a couple of line outages in the area, uh, as well as a lot of generation uh, taking out of service. It, this is a very localized area. Um, so whenever there's not uh, a lot of generation of available to ramp up, um, there are some pretty uh, drastic consequences as there's really not much else available besides some, uh, some peaking units or, or more expensive units. Uh, let's just take a quick look at the real-time constraints. Um, congestion this year uh, across the uh, real-time markets was actually uh, quite a bit lower uh, than any of the previous three years. Uh, it's actually the lowest. Um, by some margin over the past two winters. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with just how weak uh, winter demand has been. Uh, there weren't very many days at all where uh, real-time load uh, was significantly above day ahead expectations. Uh, and just a quick comparison of the uh, impact of the constraints across the uh, six hubs. Um, again, very similar to what we saw in day ahead. Uh, the values in SE and San Diego are actually uh, slightly uh, more positive, um, but other than that, there there really wasn't uh, too much going on. The shape is very similar. Uh, the reasons with uh, the work on the Serrano transformers and Miguel Mission uh, do a lot to, to drive these spreads, uh, as well as some intermittent uh, bar fill apart congestion. Um, but uh, really, nothing nothing too major uh, happened in in real time that wasn't uh, already anticipated. Uh, and the off peak period was even quieter than FMM. Um, for all of the hubs except for NP, uh, the value was within two cents on either side of, of, a, of, a, of zero, so uh, very, very quiet. Uh, and then looking at the uh, main real-time constraints, uh, very similar, uh, as I said, to day ahead. Um, it's actually pretty surprising how much stronger uh, the SX tap 2 uh, mission constraint is than uh, really any other constraint, um, whereas Serrano, because of the different uh, transformers, uh, it appears on this list uh, three separate times because of the three separate transformers that were worked on. Um, so when, if you were to sum uh, those values, it would actually move up to the, the, the second highest constraint. Um, but outside of that, the, the, prim the primary drivers for uh, constraints in, in real time were, were outage were line outage driven. Um, and again, the, the values were much weaker uh, overall than what we saw in DAD. Now looking at overall congestion seen across the March to May uh, time frame of the previous four years, um, the thing that jumps out at me is just how many uh, hydro constraints appear on this list. Um, especially the constraints that appear more than once. Uh, that tells me it's more of a seasonal constraint, um, which uh, in the spring you, you definitely are expecting some, some hydro-related congestion. Uh, PACI and NOB uh, still expected to be the highest, um, even uh, given the relative weakness of uh, the hydro situation in the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's still going to be a lot, and we're continuing to see uh, intermittent constraints on those two inner ties, so that'll reduce the uh, amount of capacity that's available to flow power south. Um, and then uh, we actually haven't seen uh, much congestion in California uh, due to hydro uh, in the previous couple of years. And uh, it's, no, it's not surprising given the dire straits of the water situation in California. Uh, and we don't expect this year to be much different. Uh, now, just taking a look at some outages that uh, are planned for uh, this March to May time frame. Uh, the big two are the, uh, the two nuclear units uh, out in WEC. Uh, the first PV uh, goes down early April uh, and pretty much is out the entire month and into early May. Uh, that'll have the impact of reducing um, flows on PV, uh, not to any considerable degree given that uh, only about 15%, I believe, is uh, actually owned by SCE, uh, so uh, the 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 big the big problem with that is just that it'll have a knock-on effect with diverting some power uh, that is generated in Arizona uh, to stay in Arizona, just having to serve APS's load uh, 
uh, since they're going to lose one of their uh, units. Uh, and then Colombian nuclear unit, uh, that's also coming offline uh, early to mid-May and remaining out for about a month and a half. Uh, and that's actually a good thing because uh, it'll help offset some of the uh, excess generation problems that they've had uh, out in mid-sea uh, for the previous couple of years, just due to uh, the time of the year where hydro hits peak flows. Um, and, and finally, there are a couple other outages here out in WEC uh, that deal primarily with uh, imports into California. One of them, Intermountain 2, uh, expected to be out for about a month. Uh, and then Jim Bridger, uh, expected to be out about two months. Uh, those will affect imports slightly, but given the levels of load seen uh, are expected for uh, this time frame, uh, no huge issue. Uh, as I said before, Miguel Mission, uh, that transmission outage on the right-hand side, uh, that's the biggest known, uh, biggest of importance uh, line outage uh, for uh, this time period. Um, it's causing congestion every day, uh, primarily in day ahead, but uh, there are some days in, in real time when it blows out. Um, and that's going to be uh, here for uh, about 18 days total in March. Uh, we're already nine days in, so uh, I would say there are about 12, 13 days left. Uh, this constraint. Uh, it doesn't really hit on Sundays because the line outage um, isn't there on Sundays, but other than that, uh, we would expect that congestion to continue and keep seeing uh, San Diego at a premium to the rest of the state uh, for the remainder of the month. Uh, and then finally, uh, those knob and packy uh, D rates, uh, they continue, and uh, that's expected to um, just lead to some ongoing congestion that we, uh, we have been seeing. Now shifting focus to supply. Uh, I'm sure it feels like a broken record um, for the previous couple of years, but the California hydro situation remains quite low. Uh, as you can see, uh, 2015 is actually currently running at a slightly higher level uh, than 2014, uh, but that is a bit deceiving. Uh, there were a couple of uh, rain events, um, primarily in, uh, in December, but um, there were some also in uh, January and February, not nearly as big though, uh, which resulted in some increased hydro flows. Um, but the difference is with temperatures as warm as they have been um, throughout the entirety of, of WEC uh, and especially in California, uh, there has been very little snowpack build uh, as Ross alluded to earlier. Uh, and so this increase in hydro flows is temporary. And if you look back at uh, 2014 and uh, 2012, uh, right around February is when you start to see uh, flows hit the bottom and then start to increase. But um, as of right now, uh, we don't really see that. It's just flat lines, and uh, there really aren't any expectations for that to change drastically. Um, we do see a slight increase in, in runoff that we see every year because there is some small snowpack in the, in the Sierras, um, but nothing to any considerable degree where it will be impacting uh, the market too much. Uh, now shifting briefly to the northwest, uh, here we have the uh, readings of the Dells um, from the previous, uh, looks like 50 years, 55 years, and uh, we've highlighted the high cases, uh, which are 1997, 2011, 2012, uh, the medium cases, and then the low cases, uh, and then the part of the, the, the chart on the left, the table at the left, that's uh, highlighted and circled with that red dotted line. Uh, that's actually where the current uh, public water supply forecast is sitting. Um, so we're very close to that uh, low case, uh, those, uh, that low block of years in, in terms of Pacific Northwest Hydro. Uh, and so that does have some pretty big implications for California uh, imports and prices. Um, looking at the impact in terms of uh, water supply across the uh, period of the next uh, six months or so. Um, it's a similar chart uh, as seen at the previous page, uh, with the exception of actual flow data uh, is plotted uh, for the next six months. Um, so that high case is, is a red solid line uh, with that uh, medium scenario in the uh, blue and the low scenario in, in green. Uh, that black solid line is where our current actual uh, BPA flows have been trending for uh, the first week or two in uh, in March, and then that blue, or sorry, that red dotted line are where we see flows um, for the remainder of the, the, the spring. Um, so we're tracking 
uh, much closer to uh, the low case than, than the, either the high case or the medium case. Uh, now we do catch up to the medium case uh, sometime in, in late May, uh, late to, or, or mid to late May, uh, and that is when we expect uh, peak flow to be. Um, but then we uh, come much back closer to the, uh, uh, the low case, and, and we're going to remain close to the low case for uh, the next month or two as well. Now, in terms of the California renewal picture, uh, we are expecting um, the high levels of solar to continue. Uh, last week, actually, uh, the solar generation in the state uh, broke the record for peak output uh, for three consecutive days. Um, so the most recent uh, record was uh, over uh, 4.7 gigs, and it's actually uh, closer to 4.8. Uh, now, that does have implications uh, for spring, obviously. Um, we're expecting 31% uh, growth in renewable, for, in renewable generation overall uh, when combining both uh, wind and solar. Uh, so by May, uh, we're actually expecting uh, an average of uh, about 7 gigs uh, across that middle portion of the day uh, with, both, uh, with both solar um, hitting around 5 gigs on average and uh, wind hovering around 2 gigs. Uh, and there are some pretty big weather for weather uh, reasons for that. Um, the day is just getting to be much longer, and temperatures are increasing in California. Um, so that increases the solar output uh, that we're expecting. Um, but also the deserts in the interior actually uh, start to warm up as well. Uh, so that increases the temperature gradient between uh, the coast of California and the interior uh, resulting in that increase in wind that we always see uh, in the April, May, June time frame. Uh, now looking at what this means for year-over-year -year growth, um, we are seeing growth start to slow. Uh, the biggest growth percent-wise was between uh, 2012 and 2013, um, but even between 2013 and 2014, we saw uh, an increase of about 720 megawatts uh, across uh, on, on average uh, across the April to May time frame. Um, so this year uh, we're forecasting an increase of only about 385 megawatts, but um, much of that is coming from solar. Um, so it's still having a pretty big impact on the expectations for the, uh, the, load, net, uh, the load net solar and wind uh, forecast. Uh, that load net wind solar forecast is also known as that, uh, that duck curve. Um, so what we have here are the uh, averages uh, from each of these the months of March, April, and May, uh, and actuals from last year. Uh, so you can see that the DART spreads um, pretty pretty straightforward in the, the March and April time frame last year. Uh, and if you take a look at the uh, 2014, uh, which is the winner of uh, the December of 2013, along with, or sorry, the uh, we're looking here at March, April, May of 2014. Um, it follows the that blue uh, low net solar and wind forecast um, pretty well, uh, with that morning uh, peak hour having one of the sharpest uh, negative dart spreads, as well as that block of hours, hours ending 17 through 23. Uh, for March, uh, that somewhat decreases in April as uh, solar generation gets to be a bit wider or a, a bit longer. Um, but you also see um, peaks start to get a bit higher, so that evening period uh, starts to get a bit stronger. And then looking at May, um, kind of all over the place, uh, looking at that load net uh, wind and solar uh, forecast, uh, there really isn't much of a duck curve at all now, given that load is increasing. Uh, last year was somewhat special, given that uh, temperatures, I think, increased a bit more than expected, as, as Ross alluded to. Um, SCE actually saw... Uh, peak load above 20 gigs, um, but when we look at uh, any of those months this year, uh, that's where the green solid line comes into play, and very different. Uh, the shape is very similar, but uh, you're seeing a much bigger trough in the middle of the day, and that is entirely due to uh, all of the added solar um, from between last year and this year. Um, so those negative dart spreads uh, are expected to continue in March and April. Um, but 
uh, the season is actually expected to be a bit worse, uh, given how much more uh, solar is there and pushing out some of the thermal generation that we've we've seen and we've needed to to make up for that uh, those two ramp periods. Uh, now, we'll take questions. Uh, feel free to enter them into the uh, IM box at the right hand side of your screen. So I actually have a clarification to make. Uh, I, I misspoke when I said that uh, solar is expected to hit 4.7 gigs. Uh, I meant 5.7. Uh, we were actually seeing uh, solar last week hit uh, close to 5. Uh, well, it hit 5.7 5 gigs, and it was actually close to the 5.8. Um, but we actually have another question. Um, do you anticipate the increase of solar generation to offset lower hydro this spring? Um, well, year over year, the hydro situation um, isn't expected to be um, that different. Uh, very low last year, uh, expected to be very low this year. Um, but with that being said, uh, solar is obviously expected to increase. And uh, there are some differences uh, or implications, I guess, for prices um, between either having your load met with, uh, with solar generation or hydro generation. Uh, hydro is uh, at least partially uh, dispatchable. Um, so we actually see it this year already with whatever hydro that we do have. Uh, the hours that it's strongest are during uh, the morning ramp and the evening ramp. Uh, and there's an added wrinkle now um, with uh, some pumping units actually pumping across the middle portion of the day, uh, like particularly high desert, which, or sorry, particularly helms, <laughs> which we have a, a monitor on. Um, it actually ends up pumping during the cheapest hours of uh, that uh, middle portion of the day and then ramping up for both of those peaks. Um, so the increased solar uh, is hurting the dispatchability of the stack, um, but some pumping units in particular are taking advantage of that. Uh, so that, that's something to keep in mind. It's something we've already seen through March and our, we're expecting that to continue as well. Okay, looks like that's uh, it for questions. Uh, our contact information is at the end of this presentation, so feel free to send either me or Ross uh, an email or give us a call. Uh, there is also, uh, we can be reached by AIM, uh, and our contact information is on the left there, Genscape Kaiso. Uh, you can reach uh, both Ross and I at that contact information. So um, feel free to get in touch, and hope this was informative. Take care.